Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Amina Gamuri, and we're going to be speaking about combination treatment, is it for everybody, on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thanks again, and we are so excited to be joined uh, by Dr. Anita Gomeri, and she is uh, becoming even a closer friend of mine. She practices at uh, NECO. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing at the school? Hi, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, yes, so I am practicing at NECO. I am assistant professor of clinical optometry there, hopefully soon to be associate professor as I head way to my promotion. Um, beyond that, I head the residency program there in cornea and contact lens. And then I'm also an attending optometrist in our owned and operated clinic called NECO Center for Eye Care. And I specifically work in our um, contact lens department there. So I'm doing contact lens uh, visits, uh, and then a lot, a lot of myopia control over the past five years. That's been really my main focus is growing our myopia control clinic. So that's been my passion. And I think that's why you've asked me to join you today. Um, and we do, have a, <laughs> we do have a small dry eye um, clinic as well that's, you know, been growing. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to find time to support that as well. But Honestly, my main clinical focus has been myopia control and, and then um, specialty contact lenses in general. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I think oftentimes comes up, and I've heard this in practice, is how do we further help the patients who are in, who are, who are in treatment that may not be getting the outcome that we desire? And, uh, and you recently have written a piece about this, which means that you've been digging into the research about that. Um, I was hoping you and I could talk about combination treatment. And let me give you a little bit of a background, first of all. And this is uh, where I've been a little bit um, uh, not in alignment with a lot of people on combination treatment. And we're, we're going to dig into this a little bit. So I've attended Academy and all the big meetings, and I've heard people talking about combination treatment. And one of the approaches on combination treatment is, well, we don't start with combination treatment because we will then not know what has worked for the patient. However, we'll talk about what treatments we're doing for our patients and everybody will agree that we should do whatever we can to stop or slow the progression of myopia as maximally as possible. So why wouldn't we go to combination treatment first and foremost? And let me start with that. Why not just go combo for everybody right away? So that's a really good question. And I feel like you and I had this small, um, short, but I, I feel like it was significant back and forth uh, during our GSLS talk as well on this, because you had asked me what we do uh, in our clinics. And you're right, we, we do follow majority here as well. So we do start our patients on the combination treatment after we, we've seen, you know, the outcome not being what we expect or want, we will start them on combination treatment. And the question uh, on why not, you know, doing why not, why not should we have everyone be on a combination treatment? I think there's um, a lot that I can say on this, but I'll begin with saying that, you know, first we 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 wouldn't know where to establish um, the first modality of treatment um, in terms of what you said earlier, like what is working, what is not working. That's probably my first kind of go-to as to why not start everyone. Um, secondly, it is an extra step that these patients are having to do from a practical standpoint, right? Like they're having to put in either atropine or if the second treatment is contact lenses, they're having to use two different uh, modalities together. 
Um, the third being that there is a financial cost associated with this because now we're adding an extra treatment. So not only practically these patients are having to do an extra treatment, um, but then there are there is a small subset that are maybe going to be financially implicated by this as well. And the third I'll say, or maybe the fourth, I lost count at this point, is that I don't necessarily think that everyone needs to be on a combination treatment. Like there are patients that are in our clinic that are doing really well with just orthokeratology and or really well with just say my site contact lenses. And these patients don't necessarily need that extra treatment. So I kind of like to keep it in the back pocket and, you know, say to the patient or the families that, you know, this is kind of the initiation of the treatment, but if this doesn't work or, you know, we have other things that we can go to. And it kind of gives the parents a little bit of reassurance as well, because, you know, they, they know that they're not at max therapy like all together, because once you start them on combination and even the combination isn't effective, right? That happens to some of our patients. Um, where do you go from there? And I guess I pose that question back to you is if you're going to start your patients on combination therapy right away and say six months, one year later, they still continue to progress at a faster rate than we want and expect, where do we go? Where do we go next? Yeah. So let me give you an answer to that question. Yeah, I knew question. you would have an answer. I was like, just waiting so for it. <laughs> I've, I've combo treated them and I have gotten the maximum therapy out of those combo treatments. It mm. means that had I not combo treated them, they would have progressed over the last year far more than they would have with a, the combo treatment. So sure. my combo treatment slowed them down as much as possible over the last year. Whereas if I had taken a more traditional approach and not treated them comboly, mm -hmm. then and added it in later, I'm adding them in, adding a combo treatment after they've already progressed by three quarters to a diopter, right? And we know mm -hmm. that every diopter matters. And so mm -hmm. for that reason, if mm -hmm. they are in a fast state of progression, then then that may be the direction to go. I love your reasons. And I think those are the ones that we need to be highlighting. But let's talk a little bit about combo treatment is, if we go that traditional route, what should we be expecting from combo treatment typically? Like, uh, you know, what is what are some of the studies that are out there that talk about combo treatment? And you know, when should it be used? And, and when we talk about combo treatment, we're usually saying it's an addition of either mm -hmm. atropine onto or uh, a contact lens onto something else, or in the future, we'll say atropine added into spectacle lenses here in the US, exactly. right? So with where it is currently, what, what kind of things do, do we know to say that it is effective or maybe not effective at, at that addition? Yeah, I think that's good. I think it's good to define kind of like what exactly combination treatment is. And uh, to your point, yes, yeah, so typically whatever monotherapy we've established for the patient, whether it's orthokeratology or atropine or my site contacts or, you know, any other type of off-label soft contact lens use, then adding that extra form of therapy would be considered combination therapy. And so we want to look at studies um, in order to even go to that next step. Again, we don't want to frivolously add treatments that we know may not be as effective. For example, one of the studies that looked at whether adding in atropine to soft contact lenses, the BAM study, which was an extension of the BLINK study, that basically told us that adding you know, atropine to soft multifocal contact lenses may not actually be effective. So in that, you know, taking that thought in mind, like I don't want to add that extra form of treatment on my patient when I know that, you know, this study has really shown that there is no benefit to the patient. So again, you're adding cost, you're adding more issues with practical kind of um, times and things like that for the patient when you know it's not going to be effective. So looking at the studies, I think is really important. Um, and we have a limited amount of studies so far, but we do have some studies that show us that overall, when it comes to ortho K and atropine, I would say that I would consider it to be an effective, you know, combination therapy route. So if you are starting your patients on with ortho K and atropine right off the bat, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, the studies are showing that it is effective and there are reasons or mechanisms for perhaps why it could be effective. And that's something that we want to look at too. Again, when it comes to myopia control, there's so many 
unanswered questions. There's so many big question marks that are just surrounding, you know, the entire industry of myopia control, I'll say that. But when it comes to combination therapies, we are also dealing with a limited amount of um, data, right? So the, the longest studies that we have are just two years. And so that again is like, you know, uh, something to consider right off the bat that we just don't have enough data. But I think when it comes to ortho K and atropine, I think those are the, the studies that have shown the most effectivity. Um, I wish we had more information on my site and atropine. Um, because I think that could be, you know, a, a, another area where we could see potential benefit from combination therapies. Um, mm -hmm. But for now, I would say, you know, ortho K and atropine being like the the combination therapy when I think of effectivity when it comes to uh, combination therapies. Yeah. And, you know, those ortho K studies are showing that we uh, get a, a, a substantial effect over ortho K or atropine alone, when they used in combination, it is uh, like a 2.3, 2.6 times uh, increase over the in individual alone. So that really shows in those studies that it certainly brings an, an, an increased value and uh, can really, really be helpful for our patients. Absolutely. So in the traditional type of approach, uh, your approach, not mine, um, when I'll be traditional for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> when would you consider adding atropine mm -hmm. and what would your expectation be of it working? Yeah, so I think we look again, we look at the data and we kind of see who our fast progressors are. And there is one piece of data that's a little contradictory as well, because I think one of the studies did show that atropine and ortho K um, doesn't actually do much benefit to patients that are fast progressors. But those are the those are the patients we want to target with combo therapy, right? To your point, we want to do whatever we can for these patients because we want to make sure that we're slowing these fast progressors as much as possible. Um, and so we look at those fast progressors. I think that's number one is we, we identify those that are at higher risk for it. And right off the bat, you know, when we are having these discussions with the families, we let them know we we will start them with monotherapy, but in six months, if we don't see the level of slowing in their myopia, um, we will start them on a combination therapy. We will start them on atropine. Um, so typically we like to wait the full year, um, but there are cases where in those fast progressive progressive myopia cases where we will start them at the six month mark. We, we won't wait the full year. Um, but again, we, we try to wait the full year just to, you know, see there are levels, um, there are fluctuations in axial length changes, you know, due to weather and, and seasonal changes and things like that as well. So we take all that into account. Um, and then we, we kind of wait the full year and then make our judgment call based on that. Yeah. What we'll do is actually we'll measure their, I'm um, sorry, um, we'll measure their uh, axial length and we'll compare it to kind of age match normals um, that, that we have available um, and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. In those age match normals, you know, we, we, we want to traditionally kind of think about a, a 0.1 millimeter change is kind of the average, but really that's more the average once you get into somebody who is 11 or 12 yeah. or 13 years old. So for younger kids, mm -hmm. we would, um, we would expect to see, um, you know, a little bit more progression than that in a, in an inotropic, uh, child, but we want to slow that down as much as possible. So um, I think I think you're exactly right. Most people will wait six months to a year in mm -hmm. that progression. But if you look at the trend line, and that's where I think a lot of uh, traditionalists might look is like, let's look at the trend line leading up to myopia or the normalized trend line of an endotropic child as a, as a graphed trend line. And we, mm -hmm. we use different devices to, to measure that in our in technology. And then what is the trend line for this patient? And if that trend line is not matching, then some approaches are, well, we'll wait and mm -hmm. see if it levels out, I guess. And maybe that's a seasonal thing or whatnot. And if it doesn't level out, then that may be a time to consider adding atropine is what I hear you saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's our approach is that we will 
um, you know, kind of do our thing of, of the year. But if, if at the six month mark, like I was saying, there are patients with higher risks and, or just like a really fast progressive kind of scale. And if they are off the charts to your point, then yes, those are the ones that will target quicker. And I think another thing that I would just add in there, and when we're starting to do this a lot more is that not actually waiting the full six months. Like if you have a fast progressor in your chair, then bring them in at three months, get another axial length measurement in that three month mark, just as just so you can have more data points on your little, you know, um, graph right. that you're creating for them. Yeah, um, to know exactly like where those jumps are occurring. Are they truly happening at the seasonal changes or, you know, times when the the, the child isn't glued to their computer? Or like, what what is it that that is potentially kind of aggravating and, and causing more uh, change than we like? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, we've, we're exactly in that camp and is, is we try to get everybody in for three month mm -hmm. check. Yeah, that good. isn't necessarily an appointment with the doctor, but uh, just coming in and getting scanned um, is included in our myopia management costs that we have for patients is come in anytime. Doesn't even, you know, every three months would be a, a, a minimum. And, you know, af after people have been in myopia management for a while, they've shown stability then it's every six months, but everybody else needs to be coming in every three months. That way we can check that you're not progressing at a speed or a rate faster than we would expect. So let me give an argument for why we may consider atropine sooner. Sure. And uh, this is what you and I had discussed earlier, is if I have a child who has been substantially progressing over the last 12 or 24 months, I have the next 12 or 24 months as the most important time frame to slow down the progression as much as possible. And for that reason, that's why we may initiate combo treatment even sooner. And this isn't a right or wrong. It's uh, we're jabbing back and forth on this. Um, but it's for that reason, as, as I always say, the most important two years mm -hmm. in a myopic child's life, mm -hmm. well, most important years for the progression of myopia sure. in their life is the next two years. It doesn't matter at what age you start to see them, mm -hmm. the next two years are the most important for us to manage it as much as possible. They're not going to progress at a higher rate, typically, through the studies, at, at 10 and 11 mm -hmm. versus what they are at 8 and 9. Yeah. So because the next two years are the most important, and if they have been showing that they have been progressing up to this point, I'm going to be as aggressive as I possibly can. And mm -hmm. it may be that that child only uses atropine every other night. It mm -hmm. may be that they don't get the full effect of it because it's too much and they don't use it as often. But I'd like to make sure I can provide that family with every tool possible to slow the progression as much as we possibly can. If we then see the trend line flatten, or go the direction that we want in the next year or two years for a period of three months we may taper off the atropine and see what happens to that line because now we've at least brought it to as much of a flat line whether it was the ortho k alone or the soft multifocal alone i don't know i i, I don't know but and it I doesn't do matter like that's the other thing yes no, and so that at that reason at that point we may consider going off of maximum therapy. And you know, that's a little bit aggressive. And I come at it as a black and a white, and it's not. I don't start every single patient on combo treatment, um, you know, especially if they're not progressing at a rapid rate. Um, and I think that we'll be able to control it with, you know, ortho K or soft multifocals. But we do tend to go towards combo treatment far more often as an initial treatment than I think many people in our industry do. And that's, that's the reason why is the next two years are the most important myopic years for us to be dealing with with our patients.
Yeah, I think that that's those are some really great points. And you're starting to sway me one way, <laughs> the other way, actually. And, you know, having to kind of like think, sit back and think about this, I think it all kind of comes back down to really tailoring your treatment for that specific patient. And like, uh, to your point, if, if your patient is diagnosed in your chair and like you're the first one initiating treatment uh, and the patient is seven or eight years of age, then yes, I, I could see the argument for starting, you know, the, the full therapy, combination therapy, all guns blazing right off the bat. I think it's actually a, a, a appropriate approach. I, I yeah. would say that. Um, but I think then if you have a patient that comes to you, that's say 10 or 11, um, and, um, you know, they've had some sort of other refractive correction, otherwise glasses or contact lenses up till that point, I think the question then becomes, do you start them on combination therapy um, at that age as well, identifying that maybe they're not at the highest risk of progression. Um, you know, would you then just, you know, start with ortho K only or a soft lens option only or atropine only, and then kind of add in the treatment later on. And, and that's, I think, where I guess the traditional approach comes in is maybe for those patients and not really for those patients that are just initial you know, fast progressors that you've identified as having kind of that high level of risk for myopia progression. Yeah. And you got to read the room, right? When you're initially <laughs> bringing up treatment for a patient, um, saying to a parent, hey, we're going to start with orthokeratology or so start with soft multifocals. And if they're freaking out about how complicated it's going to be, I'm not going to add an eye drop right then and there. But at the one month visit or the mm -hmm. three month visit, regardless of the axial length, I may say, you know, this, you're doing really well. This is going really, really well. I'm going to, at this point, add another level of coverage for us. And this is now the time. And that's kind of the, the discussion point you brought up of the complexity of this, right? When you're first training a scleral lens patient, you don't want to be doing advanced dry eye management at the same time of adding in drops and doing all that. Like that. It's just too much. So you kind of got to phase that treatment in. And that's something that we, you know, also uh, are able to start, or maybe they've been on atropine already, or you're starting them on atropine while you're ordering lenses. And now just that other drop at night, that's just a normal thing. You know, Anita, um, you know how I knew that this was what I thought was important. My mm -hmm. eight-year-old came in yeah. for an exam and she was a minus a quarter and a minus 75. Mm -hmm. Guess what I did? Oh, no way. Really? I did combo treatment on her, right? We started atropine right. and we yeah. were doing ortho K. Okay. Mm -hmm. Every night she puts in her drop and she puts in her lenses. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're cruising. My other daughter, she's a, was a low hyperope and she's been on atropine, right? And as soon as uh, she's, she just crossed over, she's, uh, she's 11 and she just crossed over into a low myope. And so now, you know, we're, we're in the process of initiating um, uh, lens treatment for her. And so this isn't just something that I'm doing to overwhelm people. They're like, this is how I, I, I don't, I hate myopia. I don't want my kids to progress any more than they have to. Mm -hmm. So for the next two years, we're going to do at maximum of what we can do. Yeah, no, I feel like it's, as I said earlier, I think it is, um, it is an appropriate approach and, and, you know, no, no shade is being thrown on the, the full combo approach. I think that, um, Again, uh, just basically summarizing what we've been talking about is just reading the room, also identifying, you know, and tailoring your therapies to each individual patient is really yeah. kind of what is at the forefront of like managing these patients effectively. Um, so I do think that if it is something that, you know, someone wants to start off at uh, start off combination right away off the bat, go ahead. And, um, if, if you want to wait the three months, the six months, then I think that's also an appropriate approach. I know you're going to lose a little bit of time, but at the same time, um, like I said, there are patients that actually don't change at all in the first six months. Like we've had orthokeratology patients, six year old, seven year old that don't change within the first six months that sometimes don't even change within the first year. And those patients, I'm like, it would have been frivolous for me to add the atropine, but to your point, like there's no way to know either. And I think that's the other point that I wanted to make is, you know, um, um, kind of 
to uh, play devil's advocate in the the point mm -hmm. where you don't know which treatment is actually making a difference or not, you know, I think one thing you can look at is um, as researchers and, um, you know, people looking at the data, I think that's when you would want to know which treatment is effective or not. But as a clinician, I think what we should care about is the outcome rather than the process and how we got there. And so a lot of times, you know, I, I want to kind of play both hats where I'm like, oh, I want to see this experiment in action and see like which treatment is working better for my patients. And I'll do like a retrospective review of like what type of treatment is working best. But really, I, I think that, you know, sometimes I kind of want to punch myself and say, it doesn't matter what treatment is working best. It What matters is what what's the best outcome for that patient and whether it's ortho K, whether it's atropine, you know, in, in combination, I think it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, what matters is there we're slowing down their myopia, we're controlling their axial length, and that's what really matters. And that's how we should look at things too, when we are dealing with combination therapy and treatments. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, but at the same time, um, you know, the outcome is really what we should be after. And that's the right answer. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I do want to just in, you know, in closing, have us uh, highlight another thing that you brought up as a reason to not do that. And that is that we have an objective to make myopia mainstream, right? How do we mainstream myopia more and more? And that is that we have to work continually to reduce the costs for the patient. And as we do go to combo treatment, it does increase the cost by about at minimum five to six, $700 a year, because that's the cost of, you know, uh, getting it formulated and getting it from a pharmacy, depending on where you get it from. And so for, for that reason, that just adds that additional level and that makes mainstream myopia far harder for a subgroup of patients. And this is what I always say, and, you know, in, in, we had another episode about why we joined Treehouse Eyes is, that is, I can become better at myopia and become more efficient at myopia management, I can start to reduce my costs. And as I reduce my costs, I'm able to get more people in because my efficiency is much better. And so that's what we continually need to be working towards as, uh, as clinicians is, you know, don't, don't reduce it because of your value, but be able to reduce it because of your efficiency. And that's another great reason why it's so important for us to do that is becoming mainstream myopia. We have to do that. And those barriers, how can we tear that down? And a big barrier to combo treatment is the cost. Absolutely. I, I fully agree with you. And that one we can't argue against. Yeah. Yeah. I think with, when it comes to cost too, I feel like, um, again, like it, it, kind of to your point earlier is if you introduce it in a stepwise approach, it's um, it's a little easier taken in rather than like, you know, a higher cost right off the bat. So um, when we do introduce like, you know, the, the compared to ortho K, the, the smaller level of ex, extra fees associated with atropine, I think that it's a lot easier to kind of swallow for the parents um, rather than giving them the full amount right off the bat. But I think again, when it comes to, to, to finances, I, I even tell my students this, like it, we are there to provide, you know, the highest value when it comes to our services and we need to be educating the patients, um, with all types of service options and treatment options available, regardless of cost, and then let the patient decide. Maybe have you know resources that the patients can tap into, um, but really let the patients decide when it comes to finances, because I don't ever want to make that decision on behalf of parents or families. Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. I mean, you're the queen of combo, right? Thank you for uh, sharing all your insights and wisdom with us. It was awesome having you on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe if you do me a favor and share this episode with a colleague or friend. Uh, we can share the love of myopia management with other people. And stay tuned next time for other amazing episodes on the Myopia Podcast. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.